I'm Chris Gardner of the Houston Round Bar Review, and joining me is Kenitra Pulliams in Kansas City, right? That is correct. Thank you very much. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. We're just waiting for this little, uh, it was, it's been like 80 degrees all week, and so now fall is going to arrive. We're supposed to drop like 25 degrees today, so, you know. Is, is it supposed to rain with this drop yep. in this cool front? Yeah, yep. I think we're supposed to get that later on tonight, so. Look at us talking weather like we're meteorologists, like you know exactly. we're doing. Like, but okay, <laughs> uh, we met for the first time face to face at the recent uh, what is it? The official the twenty twenty two Big Twelve basketball tip off. Correct. Last year we were part of a discussion panel discussion about the lack of uh, minorities in sports journalism. Yep. So let's let's go with that. I. I don't know much about you. So that's one reason why I wanted to have you on for the conversation. How long have you been in sports journalism? How'd you get started? And why did you get started in this, this industry? I think I've always known this is what I wanted to be. You know, it was, it was never, you know, go to college and be undeclared, or undecided, and then try to figure it out. I've known, you know, since middle school, um, I started off, you know, as an as an athlete, started off with gymnastics, you know, at age age four, and then advanced to soccer and volleyball and basketball and track and you know whatever. You know, I was a tomboy. I have an older brother, so I, you know, I wanted to hang out with him. My dad was a basketball coach, um, okay. you know, so I literally you know grew up on the basketball court. Uh, so it, it sports have always been just a part of who I am. And so uh, Texas Roots, born and raised in San Antonio. Oh, okay. And uh, my mom's, my dad's people are from San Antonio. My mom's people are from Houston, Galveston, Lamarck, um, you know, kind of the Gulf Coast area. Mm -hmm. And so I went to the University of Texas. I'm sorry to hear that, but okay. <laughs> uh, and, you know, and so just have been in, in sports journalism, you know, from the get-go. Okay, well... I'm going to go there. Okay. Uh, when you're growing up in all those sports, in gymnastics, in soccer, basketball, how, how often or was it often that you were a minority on your sports teams or competitions? The majority of the times I was a minority. Um, in gymnastics, there was, you know, one other, you know, black gymnast, uh, soccer. In, in, in the youth league, there were, you know, maybe one or two others. But as I progressed, you know, through middle school, high school, I was the only one, you know, and, and have had family friends question, you know, why I played soccer and say black people don't play soccer. But, you know, it's, it's something that I enjoyed. Now, mm -hmm. granted, the reason I started playing soccer wasn't purely for the love of the game. Like I said, I had an older brother. Mm -hmm. And I saw that, ooh, they get halftime snacks. At the end of the year, they get a pizza party and they get trophies. I'm like, sign me up. Like, that's what I wanted. And then my mom had to like, realistically like, hey, just so you know, like the, the parents purchase all that. It doesn't just come just because mm -hmm. you play. I'm like, oh, okay. But I started playing soccer at age five and and stayed with it until my senior year of high school. Um but but the reason I quit playing soccer was because it conflicted the season with track. Okay. And so my high school soccer coach wouldn't allow me to do both sports simultaneously. She thought I would get hurt or whatever. Even when the track meets were on different days than the soccer games, she preferred that I, you know, stayed with uh, with soccer. And so I would join track late, you know, after soccer ended. Mm -hmm. um, and so my senior year, I decided, you know, I wanted to live for me and I wanted to enjoy my senior year. And, I, you know, I had friends at other schools, other black friends mm -hmm. at other schools who ran track. And so I wanted to hang out with them because, you know, we had our prelims were always on Friday. So we got to miss school on Fridays and then, you know, finals were on Saturday. So I'm mm -hmm. like senior year. I'm like, sign me up. And so, you know, that's that's how I, you know, gave up soccer. Um, and then when I went to UT, I played intramural football okay. and, um, and then just, you know, I'm, if, if you want to find me, you know, even growing up in high school, like on a Friday night, I'd be in my room 
watching sports. My grandmother started me with my love of baseball um, because she had cable back then. We didn't have cable. Okay. And so we would, and we would, we, we would watch Cubs games. Mm -hmm. And so I started, we started watching, I started watching Cubs games when Sean Dunstan broke the ring finger on a throwing hand. It's like, okay, so I like, you know, I like them. And then from there, um, because you know, the other, you know, you WGN and then the other mm -hmm. superstation WWOR. So then we migrated over and became Mets fans and Daryl Strawberry was my guy. And then from there, WTB, then we finally got cable and WTBS. Mm -hmm. And so then I became a Braves fan and, and, you know, stuck with the Braves for a good decade or so. How did you get into, what, what was your major at UT? Broadcast journalism. Okay. Now, Nietzsche, how did anyone you admired were they in that career? How did you choose that career? Well, I mean, I do remember like, growing up, I do remember Jane Kennedy Overton. You know, okay. When she was, All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When mm -hmm. she was, you know, CBS and, and, you know, NFL. So like, you know, that's, that's, you know, kind of, you know, where I started. And then of course, you know, ABC wide world of sports and Donna Verona, you know, another female, you know, in, in the industry. So that's kind mm -hmm. of. And I, I, I don't, I'm not trying to insult you when I ask this question. How long ago was your first job in sports journalism? Oh, my first job. I've been I've been in the industry more than twenty years in Abilene, Texas. Okay. K KTXS, K Texas. Um, so you know, from after I graduated from UT, and so that was my first job there. And then from there, I went to I left I moved out of the state of Texas for the first time and moved to Richmond, Virginia, and you know worked at the CBS affiliate there, and then came back to then you know kind of came back to the I thirty five corridor. Mm -hmm. I have, my brother in St. Paul, parents in Texas. And so came, came to Kansas City, and here I am. In your 20 years in the industry, how many other coworkers have been women? Um, that, that was pre, you know, pretty prevalent. Um, like when I was in Abilene, for instance, there was another black female at the NBC station you know, in sports. You know, so, okay. so it was nice to you know, kind of have that, that kindred spirit. Um, there weren't a lot of females in sports, you know, because, you know, Abilene is a very small town. Uh, when I was in Richmond, each station, you know, had had a female in sports. Um, and then it's it's becoming more commonplace um, just kind of as as the years have gone on. So it's it's very common, you know, here in, in Kansas City just to have, you know, somebody on the sports staff you know, who's a female. Really? Oh, cause mm -hmm. I'm trying to think off the top of my head here in Houston and that's at the sports, at the stations. I'm not sure we have one female. I'm trying to, I'm trying to think, hmm. um, KTRK maybe in sports. No, not right now. I mean, cause we had one woman, Vanessa, she started at KPRC, but she's now in radio and doing rockets, silent reporting. Mm, okay. So, so once she's, I think, transitioned to that job, I'm not sure we have one right now. Mm. So I, hmm. I could be wrong. And once people see this interview, let me know because y'all like to criticize me. You know, it's no problem. Um, <laughs> Look, charge to your head, not to your heart. Hey. Yes. Okay. How many African American people, women, well, no, that's men and women, have you seen in your last 10 years in sports journalism? Locally? <laughs> locally yes <laughs> or just in your in your travels uh, covering uh, teams yeah Lo locally uh da, 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 none um you know yeah even like on the on the print side um there was you know at the kansas city star there you know there was one candace buckner you know who's who went you know st louis and and dc mm -hmm. um but print now no broadcast sports no i mean they're all you know they're all on the new side and why do you think that's the case now what has changed i think that i mean the industry i think you know broadcast journalism has has changed sports broadcast journalism you know has, has changed tremendously i mean yeah we we see them you know on the national level um but now i think journalism the, the the term the profession 
has morphed into an amoeba. Because mm -hmm. essentially, anybody with a phone calls himself yes. a journalist. Yes. It's not necessarily that they went to school for, they studied, you know, they took journalism courses, they learned how to write, they learned how to read, they, they, they all just want to be a creator, mm -hmm. an influencer, a sports personality, as opposed to a journalist. And there's a clear delineation between the two in my mind. Yes, agreed. But, you know, and, and that's what we would tell, like, you know, all of our interns, the more you can do, the better and more well-rounded and better prepared you'll be for this profession. Not just, you know, we, you, you talk to the, to the interns in the beginning, hey, what do you want to do? I want to be on air. Well, do you know how to write? Do you know how to white balance a camera? Do you know how to balance a camera so that your subject isn't slanted or crooked? Do you know how to mic up an interview subject? Mm -hmm. Do you know how to edit video? You know, just, I mean, just basic fundamental things, you know, but now, yeah, on the, on, on phones, yeah, there's a lot of capabilities that you can do now that you don't need, you know, an actual editing machine or computer to do. You can edit on your phone and, you know, whatever, you know, but it's, I think the, the pureness of journalism has fallen off. Well, I'll and I think that, I think that, I think that affects a lot, you know, a lot, a lot of people, you know, and it's, it's not for the faint of heart. I mean, you have to be dedicated. For sure. um, you, you have to be able to, and want to work and want to grind in the small markets and kind of craft and learn the profession and, and, and just kind of learn what it means to be a journalist. But now, you know, in this day and age, you have managers and news directors who are hiring fresh out. I mean, it, it, there used to be a point in time where like Kansas City wasn't a starter market. You know, this was like step two, step three in your career, but now they're hiring fresh out of school and and putting them on air. And it's just, and to me, I've seen the quality of work um, get, be, be compromised by mm -hmm. that. Because they don't many, have life experience. Right. How many interns of your interns are minorities? Women um, or people of color? Oh, I would, you know, in, in, in the course of, let's just say, you know, in the past decade, we would get one woman or, or one female, a batch of journalists, you know, one, you know, one, um, one, two, I think, you know, three black females, one black male, you know, like I said, there's, there's usually one mm -hmm. per group. How do we combat that? How do we make it more appealing is that a, is that the right word appealing to black men and women to get into sports journalism or yeah, it's you know it's it's just you know it has to be you know the love and the passion of wanting to work i mean but even if you if you look you know on the on the national level especially in the broadcast industry those who are getting the analyst roles are former athletes. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, because they want them for their experience. They don't want, you know, jur your journalists typically will be those who handle play by play or studio anchor. And then you, and you can see there's a clear difference in how women are portrayed on TV and men. Mm -hmm. Men can, you know, they wear what, whatever women you see, it's like, they're going to a club. It's the short, tight body con dresses. It's the heels. It's not just like, Hey, let me have you, you know, for your mind and, 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 you know, your experience and, and just, you know, what, you know, your knowledge it's, it's about eyeballs and being attractive and being appealing to the masses. Do you see it getting better ever? Soon? No, <laughs> no, no. I, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, it's the toothpaste is out of the tube. Like you can't, you can't put it back in because who are those in hiring positions? Mm -hmm. Men, men, you know, for the, for the, for the most part, I mean, same thing with, 
just having black journalists. Who are those who are news directors, VPs, general managers, for the most part, white people. Mm -hmm. So you kind of go what's comfortable to you. And if you don't have the experience working with a, div a diverse workforce or staff, then you maybe don't realize that your newsroom, your TV station, your staff doesn't reflect your community. And I think that that's where it has to start in, in you know, whether it's local, national, you, you kind of have to, you have to change that narrative first. What team is your beat now, your main team? What do you University cover? of Kansas. All sports? Primarily football and men's basketball. And how long have you been on the KU beat? So I've been, I work, so when I was working with Spectrum Sports, okay. we had a partnership with KU to handle their third tier rights um, for, for games for five years. Um, and then Spectrum nationally, just they, they are transitioning into more of a news, your traditional, you know, kind of news model and away from the, an RSN, Regional Sports Network. Um, and so at that time, they kind of ended their ironclad ag agreement with KU. So KU was like, hey, do you want to come on board and kind of continue doing what you're doing? Sure. So now mm -hmm. I'm a kind of independent contractor working with Big 12 now, ESPN Plus, um, you know, with KU. Mm -hmm. And so I cover all football and then and then men's basketball. And so I do pregame, postgame, you know, for, for those two sports. And so, you know, this so first exhibition game for KU was last night. They played Pitt State. Um, and so I do pregame and postgame you know, for, for those, for all those games. And then this weekend football, um, coming off of a bye week. So now football plays Oklahoma state, you know, at home and then football start or basketball starts in earnest next week with, with two games. Now, does that work? The pre pregame post game, is that airing on KU's Big website? Oh, ESP, ESPN okay. plus. So yeah. that's, that's great. And because, Obviously, Houston is about to, not about, but in a few months, we'll be joining the Big 12 July of 2023. And I'm hoping that they are planning slash preparing to do provide more content on Big 12 now on ESPN Plus because Big 12 gets it to me from my perspective mm -hmm. outside looking in in terms of how to stream and provide content on that mm -hmm. platform compared to the American because Houston's in the American right now. And I just don't see the same content, the amount of content, it's just not there. It's just like two different worlds. So do you think that is a U of H? Like they don't understand how much broader their visibility can could be? I mean, because, if, and the thing is, the size of market, if you look mm -hmm. at, you know, like the, the DMA of Houston, it's bigger than any city in the Big 12. Yes. You know, but that at the same time, there are a lot of other sports opportunities in Houston, i.e. look at yesterday. You've got the Eagles and the Texans playing mm -hmm. the same day as the Phillies and the Astros in the World Series. You yes. know, so there's your, your recreational dollars or your recreational in interest, you know, if you're a sports fan, may be in those areas of professional sports. I mean, the number of professional sports in Houston, you look at the cities in the big 12, they're more college towns yes. as opposed to pro towns, you know, Austin. Yeah. You, you got MLS soccer and F1 racing, you know, was in Austin a couple weeks back. So, so there's a you know, little difference there, but Morgantown or Stillwater, I mean, Norman and their proximity to Oklahoma city, Okay, that's that's a little different, but on the large scope, the city of Houston and where does U of H fit in that slice of sports interest? 
you know, I think that has, I think that has to be worked out to kind of figure out, okay, what's our purpose and who, who do we want to be and how do we get there? Let me, I want to ask you this. Does KU have uh, a partnership with Learfield? Yes. Okay. So Learfield. So do you work, you work for KU or you work for Learfield via ESPN plus? I work, it's, it's, it's kind of morphed in between. Um, Primarily it's, you know, big 12 now ESPN plus Um, Learfield, you know, majority of that is kind of on the radio side. Okay. Because I think, well, Houston does have a a partnership with Learfield as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to figure out who is responsible for providing content for the streaming platform. Because yeah. you know, currently it's on the American on ESPN Plus, and soon to be on the Big Twelve now. Yeah, I just think it's it's a missed opportunity to showcase the student athletes, or as I refer to them, the student assets, um, your teams, your content. You know, you want to get to know the, the players, the coaches. All, all. I mean, this like an untapped market there for me. Yeah, from my perspective, and they have a a station on campus you know, a, a Houston public station on campus that they just don't really, we can talk, we, we can do this a whole nother <laughs> hour because I, ideas I have about missed opportunities. So that's why yeah. I want to ask you about Learfield because I just wonder the connection with Houston athletics and Learfield. So hopefully going forward, they're going to provide more content on big 12 now. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, yeah. Like that's the thing, like, because at my core, I'm a storyteller. Like I want to meet people, tell stories, but it, it, that desire doesn't always merge with having access because, you know, those in communication departments want to protect their brand and their student athletes. So even though as Big 12 now ESPN, you know, kind of, I, and I, I always, you know, tell, tell the coaches and whatever, I'm an extension of your program. Mm -hmm. I'm on your side. I don't want to ever exploit. I want to be truthful and maintain my credibility as a journalist. I can be objective, but still tell the truth. Mm -hmm. But I'm never going to sit here and bash, you know, somebody because I know that that will then deny me access (laughs) to, to doing my job. And so just trying to get everyone to understand that I'm not trying to be an aha gotcha journalist. You know, if you give me access to really tell the story of like who this player is and this student athlete's journey or their outside interests apart from sports, you know, I think, it. you know, I think that's something that your audience, your fan base will really crave and welcome. What What are your thoughts on the the transformation of KU football? <laughs> it's 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 been. Fun because I, you know, because I was here when you know, 08 last time they were good, and then Mm -hmm. you know, all the years in between, and the rotation of of head coaches and quarterbacks and players. Um, you know, so I've seen the lean years. So, you know, imagine trying to have trying to do a one hour post game show for every football game when there's not a lot of positive things, and but and because you're part of the university you have to find the silver lining, right? You know, you can't just be like, you got shut out. You had more turnovers in point. Like you can't Mm -hmm. just, you know, Mm -hmm. berate them, you know? So, so just, so, so, and that's another thing of, you know, if you, if you can make the connection, you know, with kind of the individuals in the program and promote that, um, you know, you, you had players who, even though the team was suffering, you know, they're like leading the conference in tackles. Okay, let's 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 spotlight that. Let's highlight that. Let's promote that. Um, instead of just, you know, beat bashing them over the head when 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 they are already down. So it you know, it's it's to see this transformation and what Lance Leipold and his staff have done in essentially a year and a half, because he and his staff did not get hired until May first. You know, so they missed all of spring football and, you know, all of recruiting. So you're so they're just trying to to make to make do. So this is really their first full year 
you know, within the program and, and talking with the coaches, they'll tell you that the perception from high school coaches and JUCO coaches is totally different now because, hey, everybody loves a winner. Right. So during the bye week, they were recruiting. They went hard, you know, locally. So the perception of, of them in the state of Kansas, in the region, you know, the, the bi-state area of Kansas and Missouri, because we're, you know, we're right here on the state line, you know, but then also getting out nationally. When you have players, you'll you see more recruits coming to games on official visits. You see kind of when you can see Lance Leipold and his staff on the sideline of a high school game, you're like, OK, so there is a dedicated effort by the KU coaching staff to get local talent to come to KU. Whereas some of the previous coaches before Lance Leipold, for some reason, would not recruit the Kansas City area and burn bridges in that way. So now Coach Leipold and his staff are trying to make amends and repair those relationships, develop new ones, and then you know prove that KU is a formidable contender you know, in the Big 12, and that's the thing, you know, from last year, this year, you know, even though everything was great, started off, you know, 5-0, and college game day came to town, nationally ranked, um, you know, and, and then starting quarterback Jalen Daniels gets hurt. But when everything was euphoric, you know, back-to-back-to-back sellouts, mm-hmm. um, you know, at, at games, you know, because, you know, I remember days where it was <laughs> it was sad to, to, you know, when you have the national TV cameras you can't take a wide shot because there's too many empty seats. Right. You know, or when you, or when you would have as many fans from opposing schools as you had home fans, you know, that like, you know, that's, that's that's the Houston football, UH football issue right now. Uh, I got a couple more questions for you, Kenitra. Yeah. What obviously winning is a great deodorant to borrow a phrase, <laughs> but what else did Coach Leopold do to get the students to come to the games? Because I mean, you talked about the sellouts. Mm-hmm. Did he like wave a magic wand? I mean, no. what did he do to get the it, students to come it, to the games? Yeah, it, it, it's been winning, but it's also, it's more, it's not just the winning. It's the type, it's the type of team they have. They're not getting blown out anymore. You know, last year, you know, there were games where you're just kind of like, ooh, this is just, this is painful to watch. Mm-hmm. So they're competitive, but also it's been kind of a larger concerted effort by communications departments, social media teams to really get the word out. Um, they're having players, you know, jump on social media, invite invite their classmates, invite the community. Hey, come out. We need you. You mean a lot to us. We can't do this without you. So when you have that connection, you know, between the program and the community or shareholders, if you will, you know, everybody's a shareholder. So if everybody's invested, you want to see a return on investment. Mm-hmm. So I think it's it's a larger effort and understanding that it's not just a football issue, problem, success, whatever. If everybody in the university buys in and works together for the greater good, then that's why we're seeing the results that we are as far as turnout. Now, here's the question. It's like, okay, they've been on the road for two weeks. Then they had a bye week. And then the weather is questionable. It looks like it's going, at first, the forecast was supposed to be crummy, cold and rainy. Saturday. Now Mm -hmm. it looks like all the rain's going to, you know, get out of the way today. But the fact that they've been gone for a month and you don't know, Jalen Daniels has been practicing since sustaining this, the the shoulder injury. Mm -hmm. Um, Don't know if he'll play. There's, you know, of course there's coaches aren't going to tip their hand on on their, on their game strategy. So, you know, will Jalen Daniels be back at quarterback or will it, you know, be, you know, Jason Bean, the North Texas transfer, you know, still, still, uh, at, at quarterback, you know, we shall see. So it'll be interesting to see exactly, you know, what the turnout will be because it's, you know, in previous weeks, they've announced by Wednesday, by Thursday, this game's a sellout. We haven't had that announcement yet. Okay. So it leads you to believe there are still tickets 
to be purchased. Do you believe this success will continue if Coach Leipold gets hired to go somewhere else? Yeah, because I mean, it's, you know, like I said, it, for him to craft and just to really work um, at, at engaging, I mean, you see just kind of not just coaching up his players, but in this in the, in the day and age of the transfer portal, you have to re-recruit mm -hmm. the guys who are already on your team, right? To keep them from being poached by somebody else, because it's really easy when you're when you're when you're struggling. It's really easy, and 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 it happened for other programs to come in and take the most talented guys on your team. Mm -hmm. So you got to re-recruit who you have, you know, and then being that you know with the with the covid year and kind of the new NCA rule in that you could kind of you can expand your roster you can have more than 25 in in a, in a signing class mm -hmm. you know for a two year grace period so that's another thing that's helped is that last year guys had to play immediately as freshmen even though they weren't ready they didn't know kind of the college how to manage their time or their bodies get college ready get power five football ready to be bigger, faster, stronger. So just trying to get them literally up to speed. Um, it was tough. Guys were being forced to play before they were ready. Now there's quantity and quality and competition so that, you know, a, a lot of this during the bye week, many guys who didn't have a lot of reps or guys who were being redshirted got more snaps. So it was two for two full benefit. Guys who were younger got to practice more. Guys who were hurt and banged up, Jalen Daniels, Kobe Bryant, um, the cornerback, um, mm -hmm. Luke Grimm, receiver, those guys got to take some of the load off, some of the burden so that they're not as run down for these last four games of regular season. But that's why right now KU is on the brink, needing one more win, get four tries to get one more win to become bowl eligible. Mm -hmm. Coach Leipold has said how beneficial, how necessary it is because you become bowl eligible, you get extra practice to prepare you for next season. You know, not, not that they're going to play in the bowl game, but these players will get some live snaps. Right. And you can't replicate that by being in the film room. But if you get to get on the field and just kind of – continue you and you're, you don't just develop in the off season you keep developing every year and so the more you get to practice the more reps you get the more you understand the installation i mean and, and even during the bye week offenses continue to evolve and there, there was a point in the season where ku was the highest scoring offense in the country um yes. houston, houston fans know that too yes and and so the fact that just trying to get everyone to understand of what KU could be. If you just get, you just got to give them time. And that's what some of the predecessors to Lions Lightbulb, they didn't get the time needed. So now that you have a bulked up roster, both physically and numerically, you have the competition, you have cohesiveness with the offensive line to protect the quarterback so that your quarterback's not running for his life and getting sacked, you know, every series. So it's just it's it's evolving. It's coming along. Um, but I think, yeah, when you're when you start five and oh, yeah, there's a lot of outside interest. You know, Lance Leipold has Nebraska ties being that, he, you know, he coached at Omaha. So, yeah, he was the hot name there. And, you know, just was at Wisconsin Whitewater. So when mm -hmm. Wisconsin. So, yeah. So then there's just like, oh, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, there hasn't been that much talk recently, you know, but. And then at the same time, KU has announced just kind of their strategic plan yes. in, you know, with revamping the stadium and then just kind of an entertainment corridor um, around, you know, Mississippi and 11th Street kind of in there and then building that up just to make it attractive because it, 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 it's really it's keeping up with the Joneses. Mm -hmm. You know, when you have these new teams, you know, coming in, you, you know, it's all about what's shiny and new. And so you can't have, yeah, the, the, the stadium is historical, um, but you got to polish it up. Right. Two more things, because I would like to do this again. I'm going to put this out there on the record for you, because I don't know your schedule. 
but I am in discussions to having part of a my own weekly show. Nice. So if you could be part of that in some way, either live or we could record it. Okay. Uh, every Thursday, noon to one central time, because your knowledge has impressed the hell out of me today. in this, this talk right here. So I, I'd like to uh, share that with the audience sure. going forward. Two things. One, what are your thoughts on commissioner, your mark? And then lastly, what advice would you give to women minorities to get in this industry? But first up, what are your thoughts on Bray your mark? Okay, so like so the new, I have not met the new commissioner. He was he was supposed to be at the Houston game, the Houston KU game. Um, you know that didn't happen. And then when he was on campus at KU, it was it was wasn't promoted. You know, he mm -hmm. just kind of came in just to kind of do kind of a site survey. Um, but just his business acumen and kind of his vision of being proactive um, and trying to keep the core of the big 12 together, you know, after Oklahoma and Texas depart, you see the new media rights deal with Fox and ESPN that was announced last weekend. Um, you know, and then now, you know, the, the news this week is that, Hmm, you mm -hmm. know, <laughs> Gonzaga and big 12, they're flirting with one another. And, and, you know, how's that going to work out? But, you know, it, you know, there are those who get paid a lot more than I do and have more insight. Um, Gonzaga doesn't have a football team. Yeah, I, I wonder about that. That doesn't make sense to me either. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so um, granted, there are different, you know, there are different, you know, some schools in the Big 12 have equestrian. Some, like Oklahoma, have gymnastics. BYU has gymnastics. Not every team has. Gym so, you know, all Big 12 membership schools aren't going to match up sport for mm -hmm. sport across the board. BYU has men's volleyball. Nobody else in the Big 12 has men's volleyball. Right. You know, um, KU, Texas, they have crew, rowing. Mm -hmm. You know, so you, 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 you go elsewhere to kind of find competition and fit. Um, but fundamentally, the Big 12 media rights deal is built on football. And the success of football, even though KU is a basketball school, there is benefit with KU football being good. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you bring in Gonzaga and their basketball prowess. Great. What else do they bring? Right. Because that travel from Morgantown to Spokane or from Orlando to Spokane, mm -hmm. that's not attractive. Yes. You know, because then because don't you can't sit here in line and be like, oh, it's all about student athletes. No, it's not. Right. Right. We, we know that. But yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you have to go cross four time zone, like that's not cute. Mm -hmm. Especially for Olympic sports. I mean, and, and even, you know, least leave Gonzaga out of it. Even BYU playing West Virginia in volleyball on a Tuesday night. Mm -hmm. How is that gonna work? Right. And then and then and then who like who's BYU's travel partner? Who's Central Florida's travel partner? Like like trying to, to trying to navigate Orlando to Ames, Iowa. Mm -hmm. You know, so just trying to figure ge geographically, you know, how do you how do you make that work? You know, what we shall see um, as far as the future of, of getting females, black females, you know, African-Americans as a whole into it. I mean, it's it's tough. I mean, you, you see some of the student athletes, you know, that we talk to. Yeah, they do have an interest in communications. Um, but you know, are, are they in journalism classes? You know, I don't know, but you know, you, there are some people kind of in, in the KU journalism program, you, you know, you see that, you know, there are, there are, some, there are a lot of women. There are a couple of black women, you know, and so you just, you, I really try my best to connect with them, to encourage mm -hmm. them. Hey, if you need anything, if you have any questions, call me. Um, I've been there. <laughs> I know what it's like to be a student and, and, and so I don't want anyone to ever think that I made it, that it's unattainable, but it's just like, you know, come talk to me, let's shoot the breeze. Let, you know, what are your concerns? What are your experiences? What are your frustrations? Um, and so, yeah, there, there, there's one, there's one young lady, you know, she's from, from, from the Dallas area, Maya Peterson, um, you know, KU student, and, and I saw her at Big 12 tip-off. 
uh, media days. And so she went and she worked for Slam Magazine for the summer. And now she's working with Big 12. And so, uh, you know, just to, just to see her growth and, and kind of the excitement, the newness, the eagerness of, of being a, a, a aspiring, budding journalist. It's encouraging to see because it's really easy to get jaded, you know, in this profession when when you when you think that you're the only one and no one looks like you and no one shares your experiences or frustrations. Um, so to just so to see to see that it, it, it just it's invigorating. And on that positive note. I want to wrap up this conversation with Kenitra Pulliams in Kansas City, Big 12 Now, ESPN Plus. You know your stuff, ma'am. I appreciate I it. Thank you. Commit to taking time to uh, speak with me today, and hopefully, we can work together. I got some. I, I have some ideas uh, in my mind that okay. I like to run by you. So we'll talk about that another time. But Kenitra Pulliams, this has been a blast. It's been my pleasure to talk with you. I'm glad we met uh, face to face. Yeah, recently at the tip off, and with Houston joining the Big Twelve, I hope to uh, we're going to work together. That's my goal. We we'll work no together doubt. on other projects. So thank you very much, Petra. Well, Chris, you thank you care. for the invitation and thank you for your time. We'll talk soon. Yes, ma'am. You take care. Thank you. Bye bye.